name is Georgia. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm not a traditional graphic designer, uh, just as Lisa. I define myself as an information designer, and that means that every day I work with data, qualitative and quantitative, uh, big and small, data that organizations already have or sometimes crafted by myself, and I represent this information visually, so translating numbers into images. And so I always start by saying that data for me is primarily a lens that I use to filter our world and our reality one subject at a time, and then a narrative and design material that I use for my projects. I, I would say that it's the language that I learned um, to use over the years as a designer. And as a bit of, of a background, I used to work for a company at a company that I co-founded eight years ago um, called Accurate. We are together with a team of 40 people split between Milan and New York. We've worked on many different fields, with many different fields, healthcare, uh, finance, cultural institutions, and tech companies, and producing very different outputs. Every day, shaping the way that our, our clients interact with this information through data visualization and through building interactive experiences out of this visualization. And these are some of some examples of our work where, of course, every color, size, and position of the elements that you're seeing is the representation of a data point. And recently, um, at the end of last month, after a long process, I took a big step in my uh, career and um, I joined Pentagon, which uh, it's a design firm that you might have heard of if you sit in this audience, um, as a partner in their New York office. And um, joining Pentagon for me means expanding, really trying to expand my practice and explore even more how data and data visualization can be integrated um, really truly as part of our everyday experience in what we wear, what we see, what we use. And also to challenge myself as a designer, how can we inject, inject this new language even more into how we design on a daily basis? And so today I'll talk about data uh, from these perspectives and with these premises, and I will guide you um, through how actually I discover the beauty and even the humanity in data, how I am experimenting with it, and also how, what I envision for the role that data and data visualization can play um, in the coming years. So to start, I'm taking you back to 2012 in Italy, where we started to collaborate with the uh, Sunday cultural supplement of the main Italian newspaper, Corriere della Sera, where from 2012 to 2014, we designed more than 40 data analysis and visualizations. And so the purpose of this column was exclusively to explore what can be done with data journalism and data visualization, and also to push the boundaries of the discipline and uh, to make a sort of a stress test. So how much of a complexity can a reader absorb? So every week we look for data on a main topic, uh, combining and overlaying different information about cultural and social phenomena with many layers of context that we, we visualize every time um, through a un with a unique language that was created and crafted specifically for the data stories that we found, as you can see from these previews. And because we were not data scientists or computer scientists, but designers, rather than just looking at the numbers and visualizing them directly, we focused really on the reality that these numbers represented. And from there, we imagined and, uh, how to distill it into the best representation. And we also started to experiment on how data visualization could even become almost a meditative language for, for the reader to decode. And to learn that complexity can be our friend, and we can use design to let people in and, and invite them to dig into the data and spend time with the data. Always, of course, providing a legend, like a key to understand how to dig into these novel languages. And personally, because of this process, I loved breaking free from the boundaries of the typical charts that you usually see Charts that many times cannot really convey the depth of the richness of the reality that we live in. And it was really illuminating for me, and it is still, it helped me define our still approach data and data visualization in 2019. But we can, of course, blur these boundaries even further beyond the two dimensional environment and the places that we normally um, are used to see data. So, for example, in a recent collaboration with Starbucks, we built a 100 foot wide data wall that was carved and etched perforated and backlighted in brass for the first Starbucks Research Roastery in Italy that um, opened in Milan last September. And so in this case, exploring how data can be a material we can use to tell stories in spaces, and also how um, unconventional building materials could foster new ways to representing data. So this wall tells the story and the journey of Starbucks with a timeline of the most important moments in the brand history, a map of all of the places that were touched by the company, and a background data layer that explains the coffee making process for most of their uh, most famous blends. 
And then once we designed the wall, we thought, how interesting would it be to make this data even more part of the physical experiences in the physical space? And then we also designed and developed a mobile app that through augmented reality brings this data to life, making this information even more accessible for visitors. So in a way, adding a digital layer that interacts with this physical space as well, um, and where the wall is really uh, turned into a live-in artwork with access to extra content that can be experienced in this immersive and visual way. And so I guess that you start seeing the power of data as an art of materials, not in obvious, not necessarily only in obvious contexts such as reports or magazine, um, if we design the right type of experiences that go along with it. And you know, to take it even further and to the very core of what we can do with data, I'll move right now very far away from technology and I will dig into um, highly personal stories made of data. Um, in 2014, I embarked in a self-initiated year-long collaboration project called Dear Data that I used to say that um, it was for me the big data hangover cure, a collaboration with London-based designer Stephanie Prozovic. So Stephanie and I met only twice in our life where we decided to run this very radical experiment around one main question. Is it possible to get to know another human being through data only? So for Dear Data, every weekend for one year, we use our personal data to get to know each other. Personal data around weekly shared mundane topics from our thoughts and ideas to our most intimate feelings from our belongings to our apologies and laughters. So 52 excuses and pretexts in form of data to investigate and reveal a particular aspects of ourselves and our days. So personal data that we would then manually hand drawn on a postcard side sheet of paper that was every week sent from London to New York where I live and from New York to London when she leaves. Where the front was always a data drawing uh, and the back of the postcard contained the address of the other person of course and the legend how to interpret our drawings. And so Stephanie and I spent one year collecting our data manually to force us to focus on all of the nuances that computer cannot gather or at least not yet using data to explore our minds and, our, and not only our activities and getting insights on the things that really mattered mostly to us more than numbers of steps or calories intake. Like at week number three, for example, we tracked the thank yous that we said and we received and through the data collection and through the data visualization, for example, I realized that I thank mostly the people that I don't know. Apparently I'm a compulsive thanker to waitresses and waiters, but I definitely don't thank enough the people who are close to me. And so we started to look at our ways, at our days through data, but not only quantifying the numbers of times that we performed a certain action, such as in this case where I mapped my complaints, borrowing a very literal visual inspiration from the music notation system to show the repetitiveness of my complaints over time. So, but not only quantifying the numbers, but instead adding context and details about why, what was the feeling, what was the situation, realizing week after week how to put ourselves into these numbers and the importance of having context and qualitative aspects to make this data truly representative of ourselves. And ultimately, we have been using data as our unique language. We like to say that in our correspondence, we didn't speak English or Italian, we spoke data. So Dear Data became also a book that it is at this third edition and uh, well the original collection of postcards it has found the most exciting home because it has been acquired as part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. But what excites me even more is that Dear Data has been so well received outside the data and design community. So we've seen thousands of postcards made by people who learned about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves. And even teachers of any grade um, are using this format to teach their students the world of data. And so in a way, by starting small and very easy, that has opened the idea of data to a wider audience. It, it has made it more approachable and even fun. So we've seen that we can turn even the smallest details of our lives into data that we can look at to see things from a new perspective. But besides personal data, I believe that we can do this everywhere. I'm often asked, where do you find your data? And I'm lately replying more and more that I often design my data sets. And to this point, in 2017, I had the great honor to collaborate with Paola Antonelli. She's a senior curator for art um, and architecture, for design architecture at the Museum of Modern Art, and with her team on a show uh, that was called Idens, is Fashion Modern, which uh, some, some of you might have seen if you were in New York. So the show presented 111 items of clothing and accessories that have had a strong impact um, and influence on our culture. 
from the bikini to the burkini, from the Patagonia fleece uh, jacket to the balaclava, from the uh, little black dress to the Palestinian kefir. And I've had this incredible opportunity to create a site-specific hand-drawn uh, visualization to guide visitors to explore the features of the items, so both individually and part of a bigger ecosystem, um, a really big piece that was in a six-store lobby. But what is interesting here is that I didn't have any data. I only add the list of the 111 objects and the background research conducted by the curatorial team on each of them. And so I put on the glasses of the data collector and delved into these stories in search of bits of qualitative and quantitative information that could help me answer a few main questions to really understand and reveal why was each of the items included in this show. And I asked to all of the items, for example, is it an, a medium or a message? Meaning, is it iconic and included in the show because of its technical and aesthetical features or for what it represented? And are they worn to conform to a movement or to escape? Meaning, has it become a way to um, blend into a social context or to break free from it? And many more of this kind, really crafting a data set from these questions. And then each one of the items uh, became some, a symbol that I drew on the wall, positioned and visualized according to this set of attributes that I built together with the curators, with the legend on the left side wall to how to interpret it. And so the whole point of my exercise was to start from the final, manifest the final manifestation of this process and work backward, sort of like reconstructing the invisible data set that Paula and her team used as an input for their design, even without knowing it and then making it visible for everyone to see uh, through the lens of data. And let me pause for a second. I think that we are in a pretty defining moment in time where people are finally touching with their hands the relevance of data in their lives. And in this moment, as designers who work with data, we finally have an audience that is big and invested enough so that we can really explore data limits and potentials into a large scale projects and challenging the assumptions that we had about data. And I really believe we are in a turning point for a specific reason, because at this point, we all know as customers, we are all aware that the companies and the brands that we love and use every day collect and analyze and use the data that we customers make available to them. And in a moment where the conversations around privacy and what a fair use of personal data is are rising, these companies will necessarily have to open up to us about the process owning the fact that they're collecting data, starting different conversations and shaping new relationship with us through this data, really giving a, measure, a measurable value back to us on the other side besides ads and recommendation. And because we're not all data scientists, so many of us have no use of raw data on a spreadsheet. And so I believe that it's only through design that we can shape meaningful experiences with this data in a form that we all can understand. And so in the last part of the talk, I'll show you a few other examples of how I think that this dialogue could evolve that I've started to explore. For example, in 2017, Target, one of the main sponsors of the TED conference in the Vancouver edition, asked us to find a way to engage the attendees through their data. And we created a, a quite unusual data-driven experience. We designed and produced what we called data portraits of all of the people who were at TED. So images based on people's answers to a series of questions and translated on a hand-drawn uh, representation where every color, symbol, and position of the elements that you're seeing is, of course, a, a direct translation of one person's answers. And then these images were immediately printed on buttons that people would wear throughout the conference on top of their TED badges and use as a tool for sparking conversations and finding commonalities with others. So we asked simple but somehow personal questions, and as you can read in the legend, such as which TED letter are you, technology, entertainment, or design? Um, do you get your best ideas after an adult beverage or while at work? How messy is your desk? Or how many unread emails in your inbox before you freak out? And the people at TED were wearing this abstract symbol on their badges, really using them um, to identify similarities and differences with other people at a first glance as an excuse to introduce themselves an icebreaker to start a conversation that was definitely more meaningful than, hi, I'm Jordan, I'm a designer, what do you do? Knowing the meaning behind the colors and symbols on the other person's button. And so in this like tiny experiment, we sort of like prototyped a model where the data that I share generates an output that gives tangible value back to me. In this case, because of the specific context in form of a keepsake, uh, a keepsake to create more interesting conversation, but like from here, there's a lot that can be explored and imagined. 
And so another example, when the team at Google News Initiative asked us an original take uh, for how to look at their data, meaning Google search data, we decided to let people define their frame of reference to interpret the data that they will see um, after by engaging them in the actual production of data. And um, as a topic in a challenging moment of international tensions rising, we decided to focus on the idea of hope um, and using it at our lens to dig in. And so we created what we called Building Ops, um, a mobile app that lets you create physical structures that represents the idea, the concepts, and the movement that you might be hopeful for, and using these entities as a means to access Google Trends data. So as the experience starts, you're already in a augmented reality setup, and you're presented with floating topics to select from, medical discoveries, improving education, uh, achieving gender equality. So ideas that you might be helpful for that you can tap and give a weight to. And rocks that you then can place in a specific location in the world in AR to share with other people. And once the sculpture is created, then it can be used as a way to access Google Trend data of the topic of your choice, which was our client's uh, um, original request. Revealing how people around the world are searching and have searched for the same concept over time and seeing how many people who are using the app are also hopeful for the same idea, uh, ideas and context. And in a way, making you reflect upon the data you're seeing in, in a conversation with yourself at that moment. And so the idea is that by picking what you're hopeful for before starting, you engage in a conversation that you already have a stake in. And even data come, coming from a brand become more about you and filtered by what you care about. And so to translate this pretty radical experiment into a more general idea, um, if we think about what we see on social media, for example, well, at this point, we all know that we live in the bubbles created by our own behavior, like what we like, what we share, seeing pretty much only the content that confirms our thinking and preferences, and in fact, giving us a partial view of the world. And well, if through a design experience, we could make people even more aware that what they chose filters what we see and what is given back to them, well, I think we'll have more opportunities for, should we want it, break uh, free of this bubble we live in by recognizing them first. And to conclude, getting to something we can um, perhaps all relate to as human beings, I wanted to share with you an even more radical experiment that deals with how medical data is presented and with what is normally not even recorded in this concept. So this project is a collaboration with my um, dear friend and guitar hero, Kaki King. We actually started to collaborate uh, when John Maeda, can you hear sound here? Okay, I oh, can't hear it from here. When John Maeda brought us together a few years ago for a branding project that combined music and data visualization for the 200th year anniversary of the Hennessy BSOP Cognac, which I will not get into details about here for time's sake. Kaki and I then fell in love with each other's work immediately and decided to keep exploring together when, until when, two years ago, um, her three years old daughter, Cooper, was diagnosed with a condition called ITP an autoimmune disease where her body attacks her platelets and leads to spontaneous bruises, um, burst blood vessels called petechia all over her body, and in the most terrifying cases, even internal bleeding. So for four months, until her daughter got out of the danger zone, we collected and combined qualitative and quantitative data from her daughter's test and qualitative observation from Kaki. So data from her life, her home level uh, of stress, the main episode that happened, and we decided, and Kaki decided, to share this very personal journey, but not with words, but through this data that I visualized in a way that you wouldn't probably uh, normally expect from medical data. Because these data were so intimate and so personal, and so I asked myself, can a data visualization evoke empathy and activate us also at an emotional level and not only at a cognitive one? And so I started to structure this fluid timeline to tell the story of this very, four, uh, very hard four months for Kaki and her family. Every symbol uh, is a data point, every white petal is one day. And the rhythm of the days is broken every time that Cooper was admitted to the hospital to check her platelet count. And uh, the birth uh, of red dots represent this value. And uh, we then have data as observed by Kaki herself, like the purple splotches to represent the visible bruises. The more intense, the more Kaki observed that they were intense on Cooper's skin. Or the presence of the pink dots for the petechia, again, the, more, uh, the, the larger the number, the more Kaki observed uh, these on Cooper's skin. 
when Coupil was taking her medications, you will see these gray shapes affecting the days. And here is when Cooper had some incidents, such as she fell at the park or she was bitten by a mosquito that caused her skin to worsen. But there's also all that was going on in Kaki's life and in her mind. So Kaki tours a lot and she felt very stressed, went away from home in this particular moment in time. And this is indicated with these black dots on the days that she was gone. But in these dark months, there's, there's also been, there have also been positive moments, such as a fun birthday party for Cooper and her brother, or a great Halloween night um, that we represented as these bright yellow spots that cheer up the visual in a way. And finally, Kaki also kept track of her, her, her own level of stress and hope uh, for the day that she would put it on a scale of from one to 10 for both emotions that um, I visualized to be this floating line where the dark lines are her fears and the orange lines are her hopes. And all around, we added Kaki's personal notes for the day. And this visual was also used as a musical score by Kaki to create a piece of music that she composed directly from the four months of data collection where the timeline of the song represents what was happening uh, in their life exactly as the visualization that you saw. And this is the song that you're hearing now. And so, as you can probably see, this is not by any means a scientific representation of data, but I still think that it, it paints a pretty complete and very sensorial picture of this very personal journey. And many people living similar experiences told us that the visualization made them really feel part of Kaki's story in a way that probably a blog post uh, wouldn't have. And I don't want to say that this can lead to any scientific breakthrough in the medical field. This is not the point of my work. But I believe that there is a world of unexplored, small and intimate data that we often don't see if we apply a straightforward definition of what data is. What if, for example, hospital and doctors could also speak these type of languages to us? And what if every company or organization that collects our data was open to design the ways we receive our information back and give us endless opportunities to engla engage with our own data and learn more about ourselves and others in the process? So I often gather what I do and think um, under the idea of data humanism. That is what I envision like a new renaissance where we as humans and our needs and desires will be the focus of the conversation around data. Where we will design ways to include empathy, imperfection and human qualities into how we interpret and display data to make them faithfully representative of our human nature where data-driven design is, might be replaced by design-driven data because we will design the ways we approach data depending on its unique context every time and we will design the conversations around data. And where ultimately, instead of using data only to become more efficient, we will all use data to become more human. Thank you.